The museum boasts a very significant Leblanc collection featuring instruments, prototypes, photographs, and accounting records. This collection formed the core of a 2020-21 temporary exhibition. Since the 1950s, the mere mention of the name Leblanc has been enough to conjure up images of a world of professionalism and sonic perfection. The pride and joy of the Lacture Busset area, Leblanc set a global standard in the field of music and instrument making. Originally from Lacture Busset and successor to a local tradition dating back to the 18th century, Léon Leblanc truly revolutionized the clarinet work. He was one of these instrument makers driven by a tireless search for improved sound, efficient production, and lower costs. Leon lived through what the historian Eric Opsbaum dubbed the short 20th century. This definition is perfectly suited to musical instrument making, which moved from a pre-industrial production system to a mass production system. A great musician and entrepreneur, he dedicated his life to music, and in doing so, he made the name of this small Normandy village echo around the world. Leblanc Duce grew into a company capable of competing on the international market and producing thousands of instruments each year for students, amateurs, and professionals, all without ever forgetting its roots and its historical heritage. The son of George Leblanc, a local maker and musician, and Clémence Geoffroy, a musical instrument worker, Leon was surrounded by music from a very young age. As a baby, I was by my parents' side in the workshop. I heard and cried constantly. My mother rocked me with one hand while she worked with the other. In 1904, his father, who worked as a foreman for Denis Noble, acquired from him the Noble brand and workshop. Leon spent his childhood alongside workers machines, instruments, and the musicians of the village wind band conducted by his father. The wind band was the heart of the musical life of the village and featured makers from the workshops who were often skilled musicians. It probably had something of a family atmosphere. Jan's father, George, played the bassoon in addition to the saxophone, flute, and clarinet. And the wind band took part in numerous regional competitions sometimes inviting musicians to come and join its ranks. From the age of five, he took music theory and then clarinet lessons before taking up piano and soprano saxophone. A gifted pupil, the young Leon became a boarder at the Saint Nicolas School in Paris from 1911 to 1916, under the watchful eye of his teacher, Charles Hufnagel, a musician, renowned acoustician, and friend of his father. An education, as Leon told, earned the hard way with visits home allowed every three months. After graduating from high school in 1916, Leon returned to La Couture Busset and the family business, where he spent two years getting to grips with the various stages of making a clarinet. In 1918, he enlisted in the 104th Infantry Regiment in Paris as a musician. This allowed him to attend the Conservatory of Paris twice a week and continue his musical studies. A brilliant student, student he was awarded the clarinet diploma in 1920 and never stopped playing and supporting musicians throughout his entire life. The company used to sponsor professional ensemble such as the Leblanc Clarinet Quartet and the Leblanc Clarinet Sextet. Keen to enrich his village, Leon repeatedly asked this international renowned artist to perform at La Couture-Busset's church, inviting clarinetists from the Republican Guard, the Air Force, and the National Police Bands. His experience and perspective as a musician would play a fundamental role in his career, a life dedicated to developing instruments technology in search of improved sound and ease of playability. In 1921, his life changed when he met Walter Gretsch, probably the biggest musical instrument distributor in the United States at that time. After hearing the young man play 
Walter offered Leon the opportunity to spend three months with him so that he could discover the possibilities of the market firsthand and brighten his horizons. Leon enthusiastically accepted the offer. And during the transatlantic crossing, he played with the orchestra accompanying Maurice Chevalier. On his 97th birthday, he wrote, from my very first trip in 1921, I understood what had to be done to win over the American market. When I returned to La Couture, full of American ideas, I talked about it with my father, who gave me carte blanche. An enterprising and visionary son and a determinedly forward-looking father, these were the ingredients of the brand's success. After the First World War, the LeBlancs were inundated with orders, forcing them to reorganize their workshops to guarantee deliveries. In the mid-20s, new workshops were set up in the Belleville district in Paris, while a key factory was established in Isère. These workshops were responsible for tooling and the industrial manufacture of keys previously made by hand. The new technologies developed, developed by Pierre Cluzel, an expert mechanic and former classmate of Lyon, formed the first step in the transition from manual manufacturing to industrial manufacturing. Improving quality and making parts interchangeable, a key element of mass production. Everything from turning to finishing was done by modern automated machines that were for the most part designed on site. Leon recalled, I mechanized everything that used to be done by hand in order to lower the cost price of clarinets so that beginners could buy very high quality equipment. I started by mechanizing the production of keys and the rest followed. When he returned from the trip to America in 1921, he was convinced that the company needed to address the American market. In June 1935, after traveling to the United States this year to present his instruments, he created a company in New York um, called uh, George LeBlanc Corporation. The idea was to export French know-how to American soil since instruments were being manufactured there. However, it seems that the company never actually became active, no doubt to the doubt due to the sociopolitical and economic tensions of the late 30s. It was thanks to Charles Hufnagel that acoustic experimentation and testing became widespread. This paved the way for the modern era and the creation of more high performance instruments. A persistent and inventive researcher Leon developed all the instruments that the company produced and marketed, while also focusing on developing and modernized King system for the saxophone. In 1931, Charles developed a saxophone King system called Rationale, based on the Boehm system, which allowed the 26 keys plus the octave key to be operated independently without the player having to use fork fingering. Leon and Charles invented, patented, and put into production clar clarinet models capable of creating an entire orchestra from sopranino to double bass. And Leon filled about 50 patents in his career, mainly related to improvements to the clarinet. Between 1937 and 39, he was one of the leaders of the Village Wind Instruments Museum Renaissance after more than 20 years of oblivion. And in 1938, Leon was appointed president of the Wind Instruments section of the Musical Instrument Manufacturers Union and participated to the, 1931, um, the 1939 New York World Fair. The museum holds a beautiful octo contrabass clarinet made for this occasion. In 1941, after having been enlisted two years in the army, he was suffering from bronchial pneumonia and doctors thought he was a lost cause. But his health began to improve and he headed to the Alps. During his return journey, he was hit on the head by falling luggage when the bus braked suddenly and left with a fractured skull, a broken nose and locked jaw. 
one of the long series of car-related accidents of his life. In 1944, in France, Leon met Vito Pascucci, repair technician for the Glenn Miller Army Air Force Band. Following Miller's tragic death in December 44, Leon put forward the idea of funding a distribution company in the United States. Vito was overjoyed to jump at the chance, as Leon would recall years later. In 1946, George LeBlanc Corporation was established. All the instruments it distributed were marked, were marked Noble, LeBlanc, and Normandy. Thanks to this collaboration, other companies sprung up in England, Switzerland, and Australia. Within a few years, the LeBlanc Corporation became the largest clarinet manufacturer in the United States, while Leon traveled the world tirelessly promoting his instruments. Vito was responsible for setting up the offices in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and organized numerous trips with the company's distributors to visit the little village in Normandy. Together, they developed sales and communication strategies. American customers were won over by the quality of the instruments produced in La Couture workshops and fascinated by the history of the Noble LeBlanc company dating back to 1750. Vito and Leon, united by their passion for music and their experience in workshops, were not afraid to roll up their sleeves and get personally involved with production and fine tuning. When I set up my office in Kenosha with Vito Pascucci, it wasn't to do more business. It was so that my instruments arriving there were checked, properly fine tuned and playable by professionals because the boat journey and the humidity of the sea air could warp the wood. Vito's son, also named Leon, grew up in an environment similar to the one his godfather, Leon LeBlanc, had enjoyed. When his father retired, Leon Pascucci became the head of the company and remembers. To this day, I consider Leon LeBlanc to be the politest and most modest man I ever, have ever known. I don't remember a single unkind word or any display of disagreeable behavior, even when provoked. And my father often provoked him. That's what passion is, I think, when emotions spill over between people who love each other. Leon was wonderfully rational, which seemed very French to me as an American from the Midwest. I often watched him tune LeBlanc clarinets himself working with a colleague on a harmonium in his little workshop behind his desk in La Couture Busset. Note after note, listening, pushing and pulling, sometimes sending the instrument back to the workshop to be adjusted. No other manufacturer was so personally involved and took such good care of their instruments. In this picture, you can see at the harmonium, Leon's father, George. In 1950, while Leon was in Paris, where he was recovering from his most recent car accident, a fire devoured the LeBlanc workshop buildings. All workshops and offices were destroyed. Only the Avenue stocks were spared. The press reported that the Company Museum of Early Musical Instruments had been completely destroyed. His father, soon after the workshops were rebuilt, was awarded the title of Knight of the Legion of Honor. Fate had another blow in store for Leon. In 1953, he was the victim of an auto car accident. Two days in a coma, one broken shoulder, one broken collarbone, and two broken arms. He was out of action for several months, and during his lengthy recovery, his father ensured that the business kept running smoothly. In 1968, the factory rebuilt in 1950, which produced 2,000 clarinets every month, mostly intended for the American market, was once again destroyed by a fire. His father had died in 1959 and his mother in 1965. This time, therefore, Leon had to tackle the emergency alone. Flutes, clarinets, the archives, everything had been incinerated. 
There was no trace of customer orders and most of the company's administrative files were lost. A temporary workshop was very quickly set up in the garage, spared by the fire, and reconstruction work began. The second ordeal did not discourage Leon. Thanks to the help of the 75 employees, he got the workshops up and running again in no time and began produce, producing and exporting once more. A worker at the factory remembers, it was an impeccable factory. The equipment was all orderly. We were not allowed to sing, whistle or smoke. We had an hour to assemble a metal clarinet intended for the United States and an hour and 20 minutes for an ebony one. He was a very strict boss. In 1982, the Wind Instruments Museum relocated in the actual building and reopened with Lyon's generous contribution, including the donation of several clarinets. In 1989, at the age of 89, Leon decided to pass the torch to his friend and business partner, Vito Pascucci, selling him 65 of Leblanc France. For three years, Leon remained on board as a technical advisor. In 1993, after a lengthy negotiation, he sold the majority of his shares in the company, by that point considered a national treasure. The sale, a sensitive issue because of the company's heritage and its historical, symbolic, and economic value, required approval of the president of the French Republic, François Mitterrand. In 1998, Lyon, aged 97 years, three months and four days, married Mary Lambré, age 70, both of whom were marrying for the first time. His birthdays and the feast day of Saint Cecilia, the celebration of which was a tradition going back to his parents, were opportunities to share moments with friends. Right up until his death, he organized banquets every year, always accompanied by concerts. Perfectionist, Generous, demanding, a daydreamer, those who knew Leon could appreciate the various sides of his personality. Leon de Blanc must have loved challenges. At 95, he said, I like risk. I would have liked to be a racing driver. And his numerous accidents and months spent recovering in hospital testified to this. Leon de Blanc journey through the century ended a few months before he reached his 100th birthday. The last representative of an artisanal tradition dating back to the previous century passed away quietly, but not without having forever transformed the world of instrument making and having permanently established La Couture Busset as a place of pilgrimage for thousands of musicians and enthusiasts.